Hello everyone, my name is Walid. Do you like dinosaurs and prehistoric animals and lots of other fun things? Well, you've come to the right place, especially if you want to learn about the, some of the funnest mistakes made in the history and the journey of paleontology. That's right! When we first discovered prehistoric animals found fossilized in the ground, we messed up a bunch of times, and I'm going to guide you through the exciting journey and history of paleontology. Welcome to Prehistoric Screw-Ups. For our first episode, we're going to look into the first fossil ever discovered of a prehistoric flying reptile. That's right, we're saving the dinosaurs for later. I'm talking about Pterodactylus anticus. You don't even have to be too familiar with paleontology to be somewhat familiar with the animal. The entire species of prehistoric flying reptiles, now known as pterosaurs, used to be called pterodactyls. It was first discovered in 1784, 234 years ago, and when people saw it, they didn't know what to make of it. There were quite a few opinions, some of whom thought that they were looking at a weird crab. And yeah, that does not look like a crab much, does it? <laughs> well, to be fair, we really did not have much of a frame of reference. It was the first time we ever really saw any one of these things. And it really wasn't clear at first that this was a reptile. Now, before I get ahead of myself, I should describe what we now know as a pterosaur, and specifically the Pterodactylus anticus. Pterosaurs were prehistoric reptiles that lived in the prehistoric era of the Mesozoic. They lived alongside the dinosaurs and went extinct at the exact same time as the dinosaurs went extinct. Awful tragedy. Now, what makes pterosaurs rather unique and distinct is that even though they were flying reptiles, they were covered in fur, they had air sacs to help them fly, they, for, from what we can tell, were pretty good flyers. But that was not known back then. We didn't have a huge variety of pterosaur fossils that we have today. And because of that, we have here scientist Johann Hermann, who proposed the idea of, at first, of not a flying reptile, but a flying mammal. Yeah, look at that. Hermann's proposed idea depicts a very unusual animal. The proposed design of the wing makes this especially interesting, as it brings into question whether he thought the wings could even retract or not. It wasn't really even something that comparable to a bat, since bat wings look nothing like this. And there's actually several reasons why he thought that this might have been a mammal at first. The first reason of which is that the closest thing they could compare to was a bat, which have similar looking skeletons with long thin fingers and a thin membrane that shaped the wing. It was only until French scientist Georges Cuvier, apologize if I mispronounced that, looked at it and he suggested that it might have been a reptile. And even then, he wasn't entirely sure of it because Hermann's idea of the pterosaur was not the only one. Even though he got the idea of the fur correct, it's quite likely that the fur that was on pterosaurs was different from the fur that we have on mammals, especially on our head. Now, I want you to keep in mind that this was in the earliest stages of paleontology. We had almost no frames of references back then, and ideas like the theory of evolution, as written by Charles Darwin in his book The Origin of Species, wasn't even written yet. There was the vague concept of evolution that floated around, and it was, there was still nothing like the concept that would be described by Darwin or modern science much, much later. The scientist Samuel Thomas von Simmering proposed the idea of a creature that was a form between mammals and birds. He would change his mind about this, but the idea would stick around for quite a bit. The idea would be brought up again and further elaborated by Johann Georg Wagler, who also proposed the same idea, creating the class known as Griffi. The idea of the Griffi was more of a class of animals that were between mammals and birds, and named after the mythological half-eagle, half-lion creature of ancient legends. So, when we started finding fossils, we really had no idea where to place these strange and ancient animals on the animal chart. Look at this. What does this look like? It looks like a weird bat bird, and that's exactly what people thought. And that's not all. Here's our CG main event. That's right. I've been working on this for two years. Everything got deleted, I only had the chance to rework on it last week, and damn it, I'm going to show it to you. The concept was so weird, it deserved its own special CGI treatment. Here we have Wagler's strangest proposed idea, the aquatic pterodactylus. And look, oh my, it has flippers you might say, and you bet it does. In 1830, Wagler was a fan of the idea that the pterodactylus was an aquatic sea creature. It makes sense of course, after all. These beachside dwelling animals were typically discovered near prehistoric sea life. Now, how do you think it looks? 
cheap, rushed, and the animation looks all wrong? I know. Trust me, I know. Now, even though you might think, why would he consider this animal a griffy of all things? It's because he considered all the other marine reptiles griffy as well. Somehow, as a class between birds and mammals. He also put in monotromes, which include animals like echidnas, animals like platypuses, which, yeah, if you look at a platypus, you can definitely com come to the conclusion that it's some half bird, half mammal thing. So the idea of it being a sea animal is intriguing, and the idea of an aquatic pterosaur is theoretically not impossible. We do have penguins, after all, but the pterodactylus was probably not like. The actual pterodactylus looked more like this. It's ironic that after they were identified as reptiles, they were portrayed for the longest time as scaly, flying beasts. But now, we know a little differently. Pterosaurs actually had a type of fur, and it was still a type of reptile. They had air sacs to make them lighter, round wind tips, and they even had crests made of soft tissue. In over 200 years, we're getting closer and closer to understanding how these amazing animals lived. All it took was a few screw-ups along the way. Now you may be wondering, what's the point? Why am I making this video? Why am I showing off how the scientists of back then screwed up today? Isn't it unfair, or is it entirely fair? Does this mean we shouldn't trust scientists? Does it mean they're bad, or that we can start ignoring them? And no. That's not, not the point at all. Quite the opposite. The reason I'm making this series is because of how much I love seeing the change and progress of our world. And we can see it especially in science. And the change is m most obvious in paleontology. A and the change is most obvious in paleontology. So many of our original ideas of prehistoric animals were wrong. And that's not a bad thing. Because to get from this to this... Paleontologists had to change their thinking and opinions once the facts showed something else. Anytime new information or studies would show up and debunk or change previous ideas, they would have to accept and move on with the newest information, also while scrutinizing that information at every turn. The strength of characters of paleontologists allowed them to say, we were wrong, and in our modern world, that is important, because it means they can carry forward the ideas that use correct information. And if that new information turns out to be wrong, you can bet a paleontologist will be the first to say so, as you'll see forever along the series, hopefully. I'm not a paleontologist, I am a mediocre CG artist, which you could probably see by my earlier CG work. But I do love prehistoric animals and history. I believe it's very important to remember the past and to learn from it, so we do not repeat them. Uh, apologies for the monologue, but yeah! Hope you enjoyed the video, hope you enjoyed this little... Animation series, I'm hoping to continue this further. I am planning on opening a Patreon account. I made all of this using open source software. I am hoping to improve myself and to change the way I've been doing things now. I've had the dream of making movies and animations for my whole life. And I've come to realize that it's not going to happen by waiting to get a job at a studio, which will likely not accept me anyways. So I figured, let's go ahead with this. Let's do this. Thank you so much for watching. Please like, favorite, and subscribe, and have a wonderful day.